Uh, talking about stewardship the last uh, couple of weeks, and uh, that's so important uh, to the life of the church. Uh, there's, uh, there's, this is one of the most important things we can do is to challenge you. Stewardship means management, and, and God expects us to be managers of all that he's given us. First of all, our lives and uh, the time. We talked about tithing our time and setting aside the time. That's our most precious possession. And recognizing God has given us all the same amount of time. And we need to, to set a goal and say, Lord, I want to use part of my time uh, for you and for things that, that uh, have eternal significance, not just making an earthly living. And we talked about personal spiritual disciplines, prayer and Bible study, uh, sharing our faith with others, letting them know we are committed to Christ and, and being in worship and inviting people to share worship with us. And we talked about those things. And then this morning, we're going to talk about uh, uh, our giving because giving is a part of living. And God created us in such a way that uh, our lives cannot be fulfilled, really fulfilled, as God intended for us to, to enjoy life without our learning to give. And yet that seems to be a, a challenge for, for a lot of people. The goal of stewardship is not to raise the money we need for a budget. And I hate to say this, but, but I think a lot of churches have gotten things backwards over the, the years. And they've said, we need to raise five hundred, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000 for our budget. What part of our budget is yours? And that's not the way, that's not biblical stewardship at all. Charlie Shedd wrote a book. He's a Presbyterian minister. He wrote a number of books, a great guy. He wrote a number of books several years ago. And he said, the question is not what part of the budget is yours. Biblical stewardship raises a question, what part of your income belongs to God? There's a big difference there. And we're challenging you to look at your life, whatever God has blessed you with, and look at it and say, part of this belongs back to the Lord, and I'm going to give it back to Him. Biblical stewardship talks about tithing and our returning 10% uh, back to the Lord. Now, tithing or giving is really not a matter of the pocketbook or the checkbook. It's a matter of the heart. Giving begins in the heart. Uh, Clovis Chapel was an old evangelist. I don't know whether any of you ever heard him. He's an old Methodist evangelist. He's been dead 50 years now, but I had the opportunity to hear him one time, and he, he talked about this, and he used the story that we know as the the story Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. And it says that story is really about attitude. You remember the story. The man who was going down to Jericho and, and he, uh, a thief jumped him and beat him up and stole everything he had and left him for dead and, and fled. And uh, a priest came by. Now, that kind of represents the preacher today. Uh, a priest came by uh, driving his donkey and saw the man over on the side of the road uh, almost dead and drove on by on the other side of the road. And then the Levite. Now the Levite in the Hebrew community, in the Jewish community, was a, a leading layperson, a leader in the church. And uh, he came by and he drove his donkey over on the other side of the road and passed him by. And then Jesus said, a Samaritan came by. A Samaritan, you know this. A Samaritan was an outcast. A Samaritan was someone that was really despised by the Jewish people. And Jesus used that figure in a way that probably offended some folks. Just listening that Jesus would even mention a Samaritan. But he said, a Samaritan came by, saw the man laying in the ditch, dying, and he got off his donkey and went over to him and poured oil on his wounds and bound him up and set him on his donkey and took him into Jericho to the Hilton Hotel and told the manager, take care of him and I'll pay for it. And when I come back, if you spent more on him than I gave you, I'll take care of the rest of it. And Jesus asked an important question, who, who was the person whose heart was right? Well, Clovis Chapel said there's three attitudes in that story. The first is the attitude of the thief. And the thief's attitude was, 
what is yours is mine and I'm going to take it. And then there was the attitude of the priest and the Levite. And they said, what is mine is mine and I'm going to keep it. And the Samaritan's attitude was, what is mine is yours and I'm going to give it. Beautiful story. I heard a, read a story about a, by a congressman that helped uh, illustrate that, I think, in a way that we can understand it and maybe under, uh, apply it better. And this congressman had a five-year-old son, and on one beautiful spring Saturday morning, the temperature was just right, and he took this five-year-old son, he went out to the park, and the two of them spent the morning playing together, just having a, a great father-son outing and having a good time. And after they'd played a while, the father took him to McDonald's. Took him in, bought a couple of Cokes, and ordered the biggest, biggest bag of fries they had. And they brought the fries to him. They took them over to the table and set them down between them. And the son started, started eating the fries. And they were still talking, laughing, having a good time together. And while the son was eating the fries, the father reached over to take one of the fries. And the son pushed his hand away and got the fries and said, No, Dad, these, these are mine. Well, you can imagine how the father kind of felt you know, that his son didn't want to share the fries with him. And, and he sat there and he began to think about it. And he said, thought to himself, doesn't my son understand that I'm the source of those fries? That if it hadn't been for me, he wouldn't have had any fries. I mean, I bought them. I gave them. He didn't just walk in here and they just gave him a bunch of French fries. I, I bought them. Doesn't he realize I am the source of those fries? Then he had another thought. And he thought, doesn't my son understand that I can buy more fries than he can even imagine? I can pull out a $100 bill and walk up to the counter and tell them, I want $100 worth of fries and I can bring them and dump them on the table he can't even see over. I can provide more fries than he can even imagine. And then he thought about it for a minute and he said, doesn't my son understand that I don't really need his fries? I, don't, I really don't need those. I can take care of myself. I don't need anything from him. Well, they went on home, and that night he tucked his son in bed, and they had prayers, and then the, the, the senator went to his office and was beginning to go through some papers that he wanted to look at, and, but he couldn't get that incident out of, out of his mind, and and he, he stopped and he began to think about it. He began to kind of relive it again and think about what had happened that day. And, and while he was thinking about it, all of a sudden, he said God began to talk to him out of that incident. And uh, he began to realize that God was saying to him, don't you realize I'm the source of all that you have? I'm the source of all your life. I'm the source of all your possessions. I'm the source of everything. Don't you understand that? And then he said he had a second thought that God was saying, don't you understand that I can, I can give more french fries to you, more things in your life than you have ever experienced before. I can bless you far more than you can ever imagine. I am the source of all things and I could." could do so many good things for you, you can't even conceive of it. And he'd say, well, yeah, God, I, I know you. You are the, the owner of all things. And then he had the thought that God said, you know, I really don't need what you have. I really don't need your money. I don't need your time. I don't need anything. I, I have all that I need myself. And then he had another thought. God is saying, I don't want what you have. What I really want is for you to share it. And he had to realize that what he really was so disappointed about his son that morning was that he didn't need his fries, but he wanted to share them. He wanted his son to share them. He wanted his son to have that kind of an attitude of, of sharing what he had with others. And that's what God wants from all of us. The greatest passage of Scripture that all of us know by heart and have known from the very earliest age of our lives. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He... 
He gave. Giving is a part of living. That's the way God created us. God created us in His own image. God created us with His own spirit. God blew with them Adam and He became a living soul. And in that doing that, He put the very nature of God within us so that we might have a spirit, a heart, a desire to give and to share. But let's face it, some of us have become like the thief and said, God, what is yours is mine and I'm going to take it. And some of us have become like the priest and the Levi and we've said, God, what is mine is mine and I'm going to keep it. And what God is trying to get through to us is to have the attitude of the Samaritan, what is mine, God, I'm going to give it. I'm going to share. Jesus said there's only two kind of people in life. They're just givers and takers. And he gave the story in Matthew chapter 25, and he said when the Son of Man returns, he's going to call the, the givers over on his right hand. You remember the story, don't you? He told the parable. He said when the Son of Man returns, he's going to divide the sheep from the goats. Now, what he was really saying, the givers from the takers, and he said, come inherit the kingdom that's been prepared for you, for you gave. And they're going to say, wait a minute, when did we give? When did we see you and we gave? And he said, I was hungry and you gave. I was thirsty and you gave. I was naked and you gave. I was sick and in prison and lonely and you gave. And therefore, come inherit the kingdom. And then to the goats on the left hand, he's going to say, Depart from me, for you never knew me, for you did it not unto me. And they're going to say, When did we not give to you? And he said, Inasmuch as you didn't give to the least of these, you didn't give to me. I was hungry, and you did not give. I was thirsty, and you did not give. I was lonely, and in prison, and sick, and naked, and you did not give. There's just two kinds of folks, really, in God's sight. Givers and takers. Beautiful story in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. King David took up an offering to build the temple. And he gathers all the gold and silver and the jewels together. And you need to go back and read that chapter because it, it's, a, it's a beautiful story. And King David offers it to the Lord. And then he says, God, all we're doing is giving back to you what you already own. What we have to give to you really came from you. And you and I understand that, don't we? I mean, last month, those of you who have children, those of you who have, who have had children, maybe grown now, but you, uh, you did the same thing. Uh, early in December, they said, uh, Daddy, Mama, we want to go buy something for you for Christmas. And you reached in your pocket, and you came out, and you gave them some money so they could go buy a present for you with your own money. That doesn't sound very exciting, does it? Oh, yeah, it does. When you gathered around the Christmas tree on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, whenever you opened packages and they handed you that, that package of something that they bought for you with your money, you were excited about it, and you opened it up, and you were thrilled to pull out whatever it was they gave you, even though you'd paid for it yourself. We understand that, don't we? And that's what God's saying to us. God is saying, I want you to have my attitude, an attitude in your heart, an attitude of giving, an attitude of sharing, an attitude of what is mine is mine. No, what is mine is yours, and I'm going to share it with you. I believe in tithing. I not only preach tithing, I practice tithing. Luann and I, from the time we were in seminary, we started tithing. And when we get our paycheck, we write a check to the church and, and we tithe off of it. Now, what I made for years was public information. It's printed in the conference journal. It's available to anybody who wants to see it. It's printed in the church budget. It's no secret. And I started sharing with my congregation how much I was giving, not as a way of bragging, but saying to the congregation, I want you to hold me accountable. I want you to see that I'm doing what, what I promised I would do and what I believe God has taught all of us to do, and I'm not about to ask you to do something that I'm not doing myself. And don't think I'm tithing just because I'm a pastor. I'm not tithing because I'm a pastor. I'm, a tithe. I'm tithing because I'm committed to the Lord. And I'm going to tithe to this church, too. I believe in it. 
I believe in tithing because we never outgive God. Write that down. You will never do more for God than what God does for you. You see, if you were able to do that, if you were able to give more to God than God gives to you, then God would be indebted to you, and God will never be indebted to any of us. God gives far more to us than we ever give to Him. So I want you to, I want to challenge you. You'll get a stewardship packet next week. And I want you to look at that and prayerfully fill out and say, this is how much time I'm going to give to the Lord every week this next year. This is my commitment to personal spiritual disciplines. This is my commitment to tithe, my resources. Uh, what I estimate they will be this year and how much I'm going to give. You know why people are afraid of tithing? They're afraid they can't afford it. They're looking at their life and they say, well, I owe so much on my car, on my house, and on this and on that. And they list all their bills out there and they say, I, I, just, I, just, I just really can't afford to tithe. And that's been something I've heard over and over and over for years. I can't afford it. And I've said to people, you can never afford it until you do it. You can never afford it until you do it. And so I'm going to challenge you to do it. If you've never tithed before, I'm going to challenge you to do it. In fact, I've made a, about 25, 30 years ago, started doing this and making a personal guarantee. A money, money back guarantee. I didn't ask my finance chairman. I didn't ask my board chairman if I could do it. Uh, I just did it and uh, said it to the congregation. I'm going to challenge you, and I'm going to do the same here for you. If you aren't tithing, for the next 90 days, the next three months, whether you get three checks or six checks during that time, or however many checks you get, you take your check, your paycheck, your income check, whatever it is, and you write a check to the church for 10% of that, and you hand it in. And if at the end of 90 days, you don't feel that God has blessed you more than what you've given to Him, uh, you just come tell me, and I'll tell Darlene, and we'll write you a check back from the church for every penny that you've given. Try it. You know why I would say that? Because I've never yet had anyone who said that it didn't become the greatest blessing in their life. It's the only place in Scripture where it says, God says, put me to the test. Malachi chapter 3, God says, put me to the test. Bring your tithes and offerings to the, to the storehouse and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing that you can't even hold. It's a matter of heart. It's a matter of trust. It's a matter of our saying, God, I want to be faithful. God, I trust you. God, I'm willing to give you that which belongs to you. I'm willing to give it back to you. That's what God desires more than anything else, is our sharing back with Him that which He has already given to us. But we're going to be like the thief. God, I'm going to take what all you've given me and use it for myself. Or the priest and the Levite and say, God, what I have is mine and I'm going to use it for myself. Or we're going to be like the Samaritan and say, God, what is mine is yours and I give it. Are you going to be a giver or a taker? That's the question God asks us. Let's pray. Gracious Father, you have given to us far, far more than we can imagine or think. You have blessed us far more than we deserve. And your greatest desire is for us to have a heart that's like your heart, a giving heart, a sharing heart, a heart that desires to, to return to you that which you have given to us, to bring back to the storehouse that which the Scripture has taught us, to return, Lord, to you so that it might be blessed and used for your glory and honor. Lord, we're going to be tempted this week to look at it and say, I can't afford that. I can't do that. I can't. I, I just can't do it. God, help us to have faith and help us to set, first of all, our priorities in order and say, I'm returning to the Lord what belongs to him and trusting him to help me with everything else.
Lord, help us to make that our prayer and our commitment so we might be faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.